Good evening, everybody. How y'all doing tonight? Thank y'all so much for having us. We are honored to be here, and I'm Chad Conley. We're from South Carolina, so we flew this morning to make it here. I want to honor your pastor and his awesome wife, Mandy. Where's Steve Rowland? Y'all need to give Steve Rowland a big hand. That's called leadership. Thank you, brother. At the same time, and I'm going to talk about him in a second more, Bob Crawford, thank you. I don't thank you enough all that you do for the cause of the team. I really appreciate it. Then I want to have some other guys stand up. Steve Rowland, you need to keep standing. Josh Bingaman, please stand up. Mike Damastis, Terry Amon, please stand up. Um, we've got another buddy of ours, Pastor Bill Tweet. These are all pastors on our team. And um, I'll tell you what, if we had a couple hundred more like this, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in America. Y'all need to give all these men a big hand, deep bow. And I, I want to give kudos to my buddy Chuck Hurley back there and what the family leader has done. I, I'm, I'm deeply uh, in gratitude for what you and Bob Vanderplotz have done here in Iowa. And it's an example to the whole country. There's not enough pro-family groups like yours that have been so successful. And, you know, these pastors, I, I met all of them. Uh, it's been God's providence. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and it's just been a miracle. The other miracle in my life, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, is sitting back there. And uh, my wife, Dana, is here with us tonight. And um, she's going to come up and speak in a little bit for about an hour and a half. And she... She loves that, and she loves the limelight. <laughs> no, thanks for being here, sweetheart. We, we're empty nesters now, finally, and I want to tell you a little bit of our story and how we got to be here and why we're here. You're in for a massive treat with David Barton, and we even brought David. We really wanted to bring Cheryl Barton, his awesome wife, but we brought David along, too. Uh, what these folks have amassed in truth about God's role in America is amazing. You're going to be blown away tonight. You're going to want to find your teacher from high school. And you're going to probably want to slap them for not covering this stuff. How'd you leave this out? You know, we got a saying in the South, uh, apple pie was so good it makes you want to slap your mama. Well, you may want to slap your teacher for not telling you this stuff because it's amazing we wouldn't have an America without God in it. There wouldn't be religious liberty, religious freedom, all the things we see that we love about the country that's made this place so exceptional. I know America is so special that even the people that hate it won't leave. Isn't that great? I think that's remarkable. You know, because I've been places I didn't enjoy. How many of y'all been places you didn't enjoy? You just left. Well, they won't leave. And all we got to do is look at the long line of people wanting to come here to enjoy this place called America to know how special it is. Because there's a pretty big line of people wanting to get here. And I believe one of the biggest reasons, and they might make me know it, is God's role in our country planted this thing called freedom. You're going to hear a lot about that, and I want to tell you a little bit about this because where it kind of goes back to, give you some context, and I grew up in a little town called Prosperity, South Carolina. It is odd for somebody in Prosperity, South Carolina to be here. Prosperity is a big place, home of about 400 county animals. Uh, we're growing. We have a traffic light now. Sometimes there's cars there. Uh, I grew up a uh, little tiny town, and I tell people I had a drug problem. My daddy drug me to church and drug me to youth group. My dad didn't believe in timeout. It was wear out. It was belt clear and loop. Here comes Bruce. And after a while, your brain and behind have this conversation that obedience is better than sacrifice. And so my dad's my hero today. He's 84. He lives behind us, and he has been my hero my whole life. And if I can be one-tenth the man my dad's been, then I'll live lived a pretty good life, and uh, he's just been somebody I've always looked up to. You know, my dad taught me all the stuff I hope to be a dad and a husband and to be a, hopefully that guy that people look to to step out and stand up for truth like these pastors I just mentioned. And so I went to Clemson. I got my degree in engineering, and I went in the Army afterwards. You know, I had never questioned my faith or my patriotism, but in the Army, I stopped to wonder, do I believe what I believe? How many of y'all have run into that? Do I, do I really believe? what I really say I believe. And you know, I don't have to look very far to find pastor leaders like Terry Amon and Mike Damastis and Steve Rowland and Josh Bingham and Bill Tweet and others. But I also don't have to look very far to see people who don't lead or who lead in the wrong direction, right? And maybe they never confronted some of that stuff, but in the army I started wondering, do I believe what I believe? I ran headlong into that. And I started reading biblical worldview books I started seeing that God's role in our nation, in our life, it's irreplaceable. And we wouldn't have an America. We wouldn't have an exceptional nation. We wouldn't have a place that is a shining city on a hill if God had not had a role in this country. 
And part of those books I read were David Barton's. And I realized this guy has amassed a, a Christian library of historical facts that we're not being taught anymore. And the more I examined that stuff, the more I felt compelled to get involved. And so early on, I'd marry my college sweetheart, and we'd get out, and we start working in politics. Now, believe me, I'm one of the original who said, I don't want to do it. Poly means many, and tick means bloodsuckers. I, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be involved. And it wasn't official, but we knocked doors, and we made phone calls, and we waved signs. My boys were born in 1997 and 2000 and pretty much got used to the fact they were going to be on the side of the road waving a sign and saying vote for somebody. And, and what I was convicted of reading those biblical worldview books is my God's big enough to be everywhere, all the time, in everything. And I really think there's been a, a, an effort in our nation to make Christians back down and hide and, and cower and, and be cowards and not step into the fulfillment of what Pastor Chris McRae talked about, the destiny that is the church. We're supposed to lead the culture. Have y'all noticed it's leading us? We're getting our teeth kicked in. We're, we're losing all over the place. And what I got convicted by in those late 1980s, early 90s reading was, this is my responsibility. That This is our fault. We in the church have not gone outside the walls and impacted arenas in America. When you read Matthew 5 and you read the salt and light verses, you recognize we've not been very salty. We've let culture impact us. And if you go back and read those scriptures, it says if salt loses its saltiness, if it loses its flavor, it's good for nothing to be thrown in the street and trodden before the feet of men. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before the Father and be told I was good for nothing. And I believe there are people in our country, uh, the media has been part of it, the far left, no question. And they said, you know, you Christians, you got great vacation Bible school and the soup kitchens, that's fantastic. But you shouldn't be in politics because that's going to offend somebody. We're the very ones who don't want to offend them. But we've backed off and we've kind of put on our turn the other cheek, Jesus. And I think times dictate now we better find our turn to tables over Jesus. If this isn't a time for righteous indignation, I don't know when it was. And all I'm positive of is the first time, it hadn't been that long ago, that somebody was in a meeting room and said, what a good idea it would be for boys who feel like girls to go to the girls' restroom. How many of y'all have daughters, granddaughters? How many of y'all don't want your little girls going to the bathroom with perverts? How many of y'all don't want your daughters who've worked hard to be on the swim team or the this team or that team to compete against biological males who are faster and stronger? It's wrong. And the fact that nobody spoke up told, tells me there wasn't a Christian with a backbone in the room. Amen? My, my mom has been in heaven almost seven years. I'm telling you, if my mama had been in the room the first time somebody said that, she would have picked up a nearby chair and beat somebody upside the head. Because my mama didn't put up with a line, and that's lying. You know, you can feel like a doorknob, and that doesn't change the truth. Truth's under attack. Tr truth's under attack. I can come in here and tell Pastor Steve the room's 200 feet wide. And he can say, well, it's 180. Those are just opinions until we pull out a tape measure. A tape measure gives us a standard by which to measure something. And error hates truth. Evil, error, lies hate the truth because it reveals it. It tells us what it is. And, and you know, Steve can get asked, hey, Pastor, I want you to come and pray at the local community college. And these days they're going to say, now, Pastor, what are you going to pray in? And he could say, I'm going to pray in the wind or eagle's feathers or goat's breath. And they go, ooh, that's wonderful. I know more about your faith. But if he says, I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus, all hell breaks loose. Because error hates truth. And we're in a fight for truth right now. Truth is under attack. You can't tell the truth. You can't say the truth. You'll be canceled. You'll be mocked. It is designed to make you cower. Well, I started figuring all this stuff out in these late 80s, early 90s, going, this is my responsibility. we got to elect Christians to office. That, that's not all of it. I know that. And it's not just about president. we got this presidential thing going on. It's about city councils and school boards and county councils and state legislatures. Your children are facing a future we didn't have to face, y'all. That's just a fact. And so here I was, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get involved. I get involved in the pro-life movement and the school choice movement. Things are rocking along. I actually wrote a book on American Christian history because of this guy and, and free enterprise. Uh, I went to Clemson. I don't even know any big words, so that shows you God can use anybody. And, and I'm doing my part. 
Uh, in 05, my, my wife's mom died. It was a, a fluke thing, uh, and it spun her into a depression. Uh, Michelle had had some times of depression, you know, uh, po- postpartum and stuff like that, just the blues, really kind of a back and forth, on and off again thing, not really serious. Uh, but in 06, uh, she kind of got better. Then my grandmother died, and it kind of put her back in that really negative place where she was when her mom died. And a uh, long story made short, uh, on July 30th, 2006, my wife of 18 and a half years took her own life. And uh, left me a single dad with two little boys that saw something nobody should ever see. Uh, we came in from church to find her. Uh, she had put a gun in her mouth, and I uh, pulled the trigger. The week before, I'd spoken at Chick-fil-A, just like this. I actually was brought in to do a marriage and family talk. And you know, you don't tell people your wife's undergoing depression. You don't, you don't share that stuff. And I'd taken my boys with me. They were sitting right over here. And one reason we serve Chick-fil-A at a lot of our meetings is that they, they so honored me and my family. And uh, the, every Monday, they do a devotional, a, a lunch and learn, and I, I was the speaker. And so my boys there, they were five and nine. And I said something I don't ever remember saying as I've spoken. I said, you know, I've messed up. I've made mistakes. I've had business failures. I'm not going to be a failure before God and man with my wife and my boys. I remember looking at C.J. and Bennett thinking, hey, Lord, that was really good. I'm, I'm going to use that again. That was on Monday. The following Sunday, we found her. And I go in to the house. We, we left church. We left her at home. And usually on, on, during the day, she got a little better. And we walk in the house. It was a hot July day. And uh, and we walk in, it was kind of dark, and walked through the laundry room and through the kitchen. And I really, when I looked over in my office, I thought it was a stuffed animal and it was her hair. And uh, she had taken her life. And in that horrible moment that you don't want anybody to ever have to go through, my boys are on my heels and I push them away, go to your room, and I pull Michelle to me so they wouldn't see that. Go to your room, go to your room. And the devil says, ha ha, you failed. Just in my spirit, I felt him mocking me after what I'd said five, six days earlier. But I felt the Lord tell me this wasn't my plan, but I have a plan for Satan's disruptions. And I laid her back down, I laid her body back down, and Romans 8.28 punched me. Now, y'all ever been reading Scripture and you're not sure what you read? Other times it reaches up and grabs you, and that's what happened. And uh, I wasn't studying Romans 8. I wasn't reading it. I wasn't teaching it in my Sunday school class. And y'all, the Scripture says, it says, and we know all things work together for good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And I said, really, Lord, all things. All things? My wife's in a pool of blood, all things. And he asked me, did I believe it the day before? I told him I did. And he said, I need you to believe it today and trust me. And I told him I would. Now, I had a hard time. I fainted in the casket room. A, a pastor buddy of mine caught me before I hit a casket behind me. I didn't, I didn't know there was a casket room. Uh, shopping for tombstones. I'd never thought about shopping for tombstones. I had a really, really hard time. I had three or four months, I just couldn't get off the mat. The first thing I went back to was my pro-life group, like Chuck's organization. I was on the board of Palmetto Family Council. And these were my buddies. We had fought the liberal left on, you know, their abortion stuff and gambling and all the things, right? And I trusted them. And I walk in the door in the the November meeting, and I barely get in the room, and a guy named J.D. Martin makes a beeline for me. I mean, he just comes right at me. And he sticks his hand out, hey, Bo, it's good to see you. I know you're having a tough time, but, man, I know you're not ready, but you need to beat this girl. I'm like, J.D., you better get out of my face, man. I'm having a hard time. I don't have no time for a woman. And to J.D.'s credit, he's, he left me alone. I go back to the board meeting in December, the, the one right before Christmas where you approve the minutes and the board and the budget and everything else. And he makes the beeline for me. Hey, Bo, you got to meet this girl. I'm like, J.D., man, give it a rest. I'm... I'm having a hard time. What are you talking about? He said, hey, man, uh, look here, Bo. I've been watching you speak for years. You're Mr. Positive. This ain't going to beat you. And uh, I said, J.D., this this is a hard time. He said, you know, Chad, you know that talk you do about counting your blessings? And do y'all hate when people use your words against you? And I, I, well, yeah, I wrote it. And he said, read your notes. And I went home that night and I wrote down 103 blessings. And the Lord gave me three very specific prayers. And one of them was, if you're going to send me somebody, Lord, she's got to be somebody who helped me honor my wife's life to my boys and not be threatened by it. Very specific prayer. And I also prayed very specifically. I didn't want a guy in the picture. I didn't want to trade kids on the weekends. I never prayed for a widow. I never remember praying for a widow, but I guess that's what it was. I go to the January board meeting. 
here he comes again. I'm like, oh, man, give it a rest, JB. Give me what's, what's up. He comes in. He said, man, you got to meet this girl. I said, okay, what's her name? He said, Dana. I said, uh, JD, how would she become single? And he said, oh, the same way you did. And her husband took his life almost two years to the day before my wife. And she had two little girls. Obviously, she was beautiful. We met and we dated. And she chased me all over South Carolina. It was, it was tough. And I let her catch me, but that's Dana. Dana, wave again. And that's 16 years ago. Um, <laughs> we are blessed and highly favored. Uh, the girls were two and five when their dad died. My boys were five and nine. We come home from the honeymoon with four kids below 10 who'd all lost a parent. That's 16 years ago there. And here's the message. I, the reason I tell that story. I would not have given you anything that I'd ever be here or anywhere else encouraging you or anybody else about anything. And the fact that God restored us and gave us a new family and, and created something out of nothing tells me he wasn't done with me. And my message to you is that means he's not done with you either. He's not done with you. He's not done with your church. He's not done with our nation. And I, I needed that message. I, I really did. There's so much discouragement out there in our world today. We all need that message. Now, get this. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need this church. He doesn't need America. God's going to do his purposes. But he's always looking for whoever says, here I am, send me. Who's going to stand in the gap? You know, and Dana and I have been blessed, and we put a family back together, and a few years later, 2011, I ran for state party chairman in South Carolina, got elected, and just like Iowa, y'all are first caucus state and first in the nation, we're first in the South. And so there's a big, bright spotlight, and I got a front row seat to the 2012 election, and I literally did every political show on television. And I was, common theme, I was saying stuff like, they got to come to South Carolina to talk about South Carolina issues and things like life and marriage and the defense of Israel and religious liberty. These are important issues. And let's face it, some states would ignore those issues if Iowa and South Carolina were not in the mix. But I also was given a message like this. Our party's the dumb party. We don't even talk to the base. These are our people. Christians that don't need outreach, they just need engagement. And we're not even talking to them. And I say, look, they don't, they don't want to be R's or D's as much as they want to vote biblically. And that's just, that was my theme. It's my theme today is Christians don't, these aren't political issues. These are biblical issues. They've been politicized, but it doesn't remove our responsibility to tell the truth. And so here I was, I, I did these TV shows, and a guy named Reince Priebus, who y'all know now was Trump's first chief of staff, saw me on MSNBC. Steve, I'm not promoting MSNBC to your folks. I just, where I was. And so a guy named Al Sharpton was doing the interview. It was, it was awful. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. His producers saying bad stuff about Christians in the earbud, and he's interviewing me. Kept calling me, kept telling me to call him Reverend Al. I thought, man, I've got far too much respect for reverends to call you one. But anyway, so Wright saw the TV show and texted me. I was one of his 50 chairmen, so I, I, I knew him, but I didn't have any relationship. And he texted me and said, hey, you did a nice job in a tough environment, a hostile environment, defending your faith. Thank you very much. I'm a believer too. Let's talk. And I basically was just saying, look, you got to go talk to the Christians. Let's maximize the Christian vote. If we ever get the Christians to come out and vote like Christians should, and I started doing research. David Barton, George Barn, have done all this research. Some 80 million people sitting in churches, 30, 31 million vote. Uh, under everybody's definition, somewhere between 40 and 50 million people who profess the name of Christ don't vote at all. If Christians would vote in numbers, we could. People who hate God, because look, they hate you too, but they really hate him. Well, there are people today that would argue with you about, and there's kids in the room, uh, grown men dancing in front of children. Why, why does that have to go on? Why, why do they feel the need to do that, y'all? There are other people that think it's okay to surgically remove things from children as young as they want it because they should be able to decide. That's insanity. And we don't need to stand by and take it. And it's our fault that that happens in city councils and school boards because we're too busy to get involved. That's exactly what it is. So this has been my burden now for almost 30 years that if we just get Christians to do the Matthew 5 part, man, we go take our nation back for God. Not that he needs us. But we have a mantle and stewardship responsibility to take care of that which he's entrusted to us. And so here I was. I'm involved in politics. I'm trying to get Christians involved. I just want them to go vote biblical values. I don't necessarily want them to be R or D, but I do want them to be committed to values and to committed to voting those values. 
And so Reince and I taught. We created a thing called GOP Faith. I got to be the first ever national director of faith engagement for either party from 13 to 17. I, I went to 43 of those states that Roger mentioned and spoke to about 80,000 pastors all over the country. Simple message. We don't need you to charge the beach at D-Day. We're not asking for that. Can you register 100% of the people in your church to vote and you're teach, teaching to vote bi biblical values? That's it. Register everybody and vote biblical values. That's it. In 2013 and 2017, in 2014, we flipped nine U.S. Senate state seats. And y'all pretty happy about Roe v. Wade being overturned? They didn't vote until just a year ago, right? A couple years ago on the Dobbs case. Those senators were elected in 2014. Those nine senators flipped the U.S. Senate for the first. Never ha had been done since Reconstruction in America. And I'm telling you, it wasn't just because of what we did, but we were intentional in going in those states and talking to Christians. Go vote your values. Don't, you cannot, look, I, I, my thing has been, I, I've never voted for somebody who would take a baby's life out of a mommy's tummy. I've never voted. I've written in Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse. I don't care what uniform you're wearing. If somebody will take life, they don't care about your liberty. Amen? They don't care a bit about your liberty. Did we get a lesson on this the last few years? People don't care about life. That's why your question for everybody who runs, where do you stand on life? And they'll go, well, I'm on the school board. Doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, it matters. Because by you letting me know where you stand on the idea of life, I know where you stand on everything else. If they don't care about life, they don't care about liberty. Think about the nation's birth certificate with the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Because liberty and pursuit of happiness have very little value if you're dead. Got to go in that order. So yes, when somebody says, why would you be about life? It's in our nation's birth certificate, brother. That's why. But it's also a biblical issue made in God's image with plan and purpose for life. And yet we've seen this turned upside down. And I'll tell you the truth. I find that people who are wrong on life are wrong on things like taxes, immigration policy, foreign policy. I don't really care what the issue is. If they're wrong on life, I believe they're wrong. I've never voted for somebody who would take a baby's life. And you ought to be asking everybody who runs for anything, where do you stand on life? If they do something like, well, I'm pro-life, but. No, no, I'm trying to find the circumstance where it's the baby's fault. We need to love on people who go through that. We need to care for them and take care of them. But it's a life, and two wrongs don't make a right. Amen? And I think if you communicate that to people, if they see your Christian faith coming out in God's plan and purpose, they'll start responding to that. So here I was, we're all over the place, 2016. Uh, I had written the Reince Priebus in 2013. If your side ever hits 80% of the evangelical vote, vote for the most conservative person. They can't win dog catcher, they can't win president, they can't win Congress. Go back and do the math yourself. I got an engineering degree, so I'm a numbers person. I go back and do all those numbers back years and years and years. They cannot win, I don't care what the race is, your county council, your school board. And when David Barton goes through some of his numbers, you'll be convinced too. This is on us, y'all. I left the RNC. I guess I'm one of the only senior staffers not to go work in the Trump White House. It means I'm the only one not to be fired. They all got fired. I started Faith Wins. It was a total God thing. I asked God to connect me to pastors. That's how I met Mike Damastis and Terry Amon and Steve Rowland and Josh Bingaman. As I, Lord, show me your leaders who are already doing the right stuff out in the community. They're doing outreach outside the church to talk to people in the mission field of politics. Like I said, poly is meaning and ticket means bloodsuckers. But it doesn't mean they don't need our influence. And it's not just about votes. It's about voices and impact. In 2021, our little team got involved in the state of Virginia. Did y'all follow Virginia? The whole parental rights stuff? M remember that? That, that? McAuliffe said that it was the state's responsibility to raise the kids, not the family, not the parents. And people went nuts. And did y'all remember the story of the, 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 the dad who went to a school board meeting, and his mask fell down. And the reason he was there at the school board meeting was his 15-year-old daughter was assaulted by a boy pretending to be a girl in the girls' restroom. Y'all, who, who remembers this story? And, and but was, what made it worse was the same boy wearing a dress pretending to be a girl was moved from another school district where they hid the assault of a 13-year-old girl. So two school districts collude to put this kid in another school district where he assaults another one 13-year-old, one 15-year-old girl. This is insanity. 
And nobody on the school boards, not only they cover it up, they don't tell nobody. How many of you dads have daughters? I got two girls. How many of y'all would have a hard time standing in front of the school board and keeping it together? Y'all with me? I think we'd have gone out back to the wood pile and we'd have had a conversation. He, so he's standing there. I got so much respect for this guy. His, his mask comes down and a, a police guy taps him on the shoulder. He turns around. They say he's going for him. They put him on the ground and arrest him. They didn't do nothing to the kid who assaulted the two girls. They've hidden him, gone off. Well, people were mad. But the other thing that happened in Virginia was they had a governor. They passed a new law in Virginia. They had a problem in Virginia. Babies were surviving abortions. Now, get this. The baby, they try to kill the baby. The baby survives. The state legislature in Virginia passed a new law. Virginia had become California East is what was going on. It was like the social experimentation place, all the all evil stuff. They passed a new law to let the babies die comfortably. That's wicked. Any human being would have taken care of mamas, grandmamas, anybody, would have taken care of babies. Let them die comfortably. The then governor goes to the legislature, they're high-fiving and clapping. So there's something else that ran that time, and our little team of seven pastors, I just named four of them here in Iowa, we had seven pastors that sat in a room in Virginia Beach, and we said, you know what, we're going to do something about this. And we went out there, and I found ten house districts where progressives had won by less than three points. And we decided we're going to call this the run-up-the-score plan. What would happen if we got 25 churches in all 10 districts to maximize the Christian vote? Don't tell them who to vote for. Don't tell them how to vote. But there are people in this room who don't vote because you think it just don't matter. I, I get it. There are people in this room that have friends and family that don't vote. They don't, it just don't matter. It, it matters. It, it matters. And I know some people don't trust the process. We kind of handle that too. Well, those 10 pastors, the seven pastors became 10, and instead of finding 25 churches, we found 312 churches in those 10 districts that did Christian voter registration. We registered 77,000 new Christians who'd never voted before, and a guy named Yunkin won by 65,300. And that's right. And, you know... One of our pastors went to the inaugural, and he was kind of upset because Yunkin didn't have a pastor to pray. You know why? At the end of the inauguration, Glenn Yunkin grabbed his wife's hand, his wife's hand, his lieutenant governor's hand, she grabbed her husband's hand, the attorney general's hand, who grabbed his wife's hand, and the new governor prayed in Jesus' name on the state house steps. That's like a 180-degree turn. And it, it wasn't because of us. It, we, we, we made a difference, but we didn't care about the credit. Y'all, we're losing our country. We're, we're losing our country to people that hate you and hate him. They hate the things that have made the country successful, and they want to take our country. You can't explain this any other way. You know what else happened? We recruited poll watchers, and we recruited 1,343 people in those 312 churches to be Christian eyeballs on the process. I hope all y'all are caucus goers, but I hope all y'all get involved in the poll watching process. I believe there ought to be Christian eyeballs. I'll tell you two quick stories. I told them to look for two things. People over 100 who are voting, and, and they can vote, but that's, would y'all agree that'd be a flag? Anybody, y'all with me? Or more than six registered in a household. One day they called and said, Chad, we found 17 people registered in this one house. What do you think? I said, I think it's a big house. Why don't y'all run by there? It was a field. No building on the field. That lady who ran that county election commission was arrested a year and a half ago for voter fraud. Uh, these are Sunday school classes. These are Sunday, they're not trained political people. They're people like me and you that said, I'm sick of this. I am sick of this. I want to take my country back for righteousness and truth. Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is reproached to any people. If the, if the foundations be destroyed, rather the righteous to do, Psalm 11.3. What are they to do? We're to get involved and take it back. You know, that we, there are now three of those election officials in Virginia that have been arrested. Two are in jail already. One more is under indictment and going to be going to jail because we found them cheating. Last story I'll tell you, and I'll get this guy up. In Michigan, we did this in nine states. In Michigan, I have a pastor named Jeff Hall. He'd be like these four guys I mentioned. Jeff recruited over 400 people 
to just monitor the polls, and we looked at the early vote. Jeff found a guy, and all we did, we're looking at 100-year-olds that voted. We, we separated the pages into a, a, a hundred, and people sat around tables like this and just looked at them. I told them, just flag people over a hundred. Of the first 200 people they looked at, we found 67 online obituaries. The state, Secretary of State in the state of Michigan sued her own state to keep dead people on the voter rolls after our Sunday school classes. But my, bet, my favorite story is we found a guy named Jason Daniel. Jason, it flagged because of his birthday. He voted twice in 2020, which is terrible. Jason was born in 1850. 1850. I, and, and look, I, I don't know what goes on, but I know it helps it when Christian eyeballs on the process. We're here because we need your help. We need you to get involved like never before. I know you're in Iowa, and it's great, and you've got an awesome governor. I get all that. But now's the time to send a message to people who want to dismantle America. Now's the time to go vote in bigger numbers, get involved. Don't let anybody, don't leave any stone unturned. You need to talk to everybody you know in every church you know. Maximize your vote and your voice. Don't tell them who to vote for. Don't tell them how to vote, just like I said on the video. But tell them to vote biblically. Use voter guides. I know Family Leader does a fantastic job. Get involved at the local level. Not just about the caucus for president. It's about the school board and the city council. In our Sunday school class, a lady who'd never been involved found they spent $94,000 in our school district, our little Newberry County of books that are filthy. And she called them out for it and the school board didn't even know about it. It was a teacher there, a, a person at the district office ordering books that you and I wouldn't let your kids have any access to. When they say it's censorship, no, it's just not age appropriate. There's a difference in letting an eight-year-old read this stuff and an adult. And all we're saying is this is not age appropriate. Go get involved at the local level. And so a few years ago, I decided, you know what's missing? People, I can show them how. People say, I don't know what to do. I do. I, I, God's let me be in politics at the highest level for this right here. I know exactly what to tell you to do. That's why we came. We've done 132 of these meetings last year in 24 states. I think we've been in 22 states so far this year. And about three years ago, I called this guy and said, man, would you go around with me? I want to put you in strategic places, not just for president, not just for Congress, not just for Senate races for Christians to maximize their vote and their voice all over the country. I've been reading David Barton's stuff for 30 years. If you've never read it, you've never seen it, you're gonna be blown away. His family and he have amassed 160,000 documents of American history, 120,000 of them before 1812. If you go to their library, you hold Bibles that the founders wrote in the margins. They own that stuff. So when somebody says, some pointy-headed nerd university professor, well, I think the founders thought, no, 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 they know what they thought was they can read their words. And if you find one of them that want to debate this guy, tell your friends, bring popcorn, this is going to be fun. <laughs> Y'all are in for a treat. This is simply America's greatest living Christian historian. You need to buckle on, hold on tight, and welcome my friend, David Barton.